So a lot of people think with all this new exciting vector stuff that the way forward is some kind of hybrid between traditional and uh, exciting new ways of uh, searching. So we're going to have a talk now from Roman, who is a principal engineer at Delivery Hero. He's one of the few people to have spoken at both Haystack US and Haystack EU, which we had in Berlin last year, and will return to Europe in the uh, autumn, the fall of this year. So uh, he is going to be talking about learning to hybrid search. Roman. Okay. Hi, uh, so my name is Roman and today we're going to talk about hybrid search and more practical aspects of doing it. Uh, so that's me, uh, I've worked in different areas before settling in search and personalization for quite some time. I also am a maintainer of a tool called MetaRank. If you never heard about it before, you definitely will today. And I'm working for Delivery Hero as a, on search and relevancy. And Delivery Hero is a type of a company no one actually heard about, but it's kind of a large and publicly traded, but it's doing food delivery across the world, but not in US. So that happens. Uh, um, and uh, the talk is, uh, try to make this talk more practical and less opinionated because uh, typical, like a corporate uh, talks about hybrid search that we build something which we are now not going to share with you because we use some like proprietary tools for that and our data is also locked into only our company. So. It's, and if, even if I wanted to share some uh, details about the conversion improvements or something, it's also kind of limited because it can be an insider information. So that's kind of a complicated thing. But many companies using different tools, different technologies, but at the end they have the same problems regarding ranking, especially in e-commerce. And um, that the main problem is ha having some sort of a balance between making your visitor happier to provide the best relevancy ever and making your financial department happier to make some money out of your <coughs> visitors by understanding what these visitors are actually searching for. Uh, in a perfect world, there would be some sort of, you know, a track for e-commerce that you can have some objective way of measuring different algorithms on the same relevancy uh, reference data set, but there were no e-commerce data sets available before. But actually, that's not the case because there is an ESCI Amazon data set, which is so wonderful, there would be a couple of slides on that. Uh, so it's a lot of different hard queries in different languages, a lot of real products with text information and a lot of explicit relevancy labels. What is relevant and what is not relevant. By hard queries, they're kind of a hard, like platinum drywall tools nail spotter. I have no idea what's that, but it's kind of a hard query. And this is not a one data set, but actually two, the small one, which is cont contains like more harder queries because there is not so many exact matches and a lot of complementary and uh, irrelevant products. And the large one, which is like a super set of a small one. So large contains small, but it's kind of the same products here and there. And the products uh, containing a lot of different information, but most of this information is text, like title, description, some bullet points, and that's literally it. Uh, there is no categories, no metadata, no reviews, and for me, as a person working on e-commerce search, having no metadata is a kind of a problematic situation because the metadata what and behavioral metadata was usually driving the relevancy in e-commerce. Uh, but this, there is an identifier, which is not like a something, but a real identifier of a product on Amazon. And if you Google it, you will find the actual product with this identifier. So why, and there is also this information like price, number of rating, like the popularity on, and all that things. But why don't we just, you know, scrape it? So that was, that's the reason how this extra supplementary data set for the ESCI was created, just scraping the majority of all the products in the ESCI, but uh, also having some metadata. I'm going to show you how it looks like inside because it won't fit on the single slide. But actually, it's, uh, actually, it's just, number of stars, number of care ratings, category information, attributes, all that stuff you can have from the product on Amazon, even the picture. And that's uh, for almost all of the products. 
And then uh, the agenda, what we're going to do. We're trying to use this ESCI data set uh, for a hybrid search. We'll throw different things there and see what sticks and start with some basic baseline, traditional approaches, BM25, do some learn to rank. Then we go to the area of hybrid search and vector search, do some B encoders, how this mini LM is good if we don't fine tune it, if we fine tune it, and finish with the cross encoders. Both of the shell from sentence transformers I'll fine tuned on this particular data set. And as a meta rank maintainer, I can't just stop by not plugging my tool here for the evaluation. We don't write a lot of Python code here. We just like throw the data at meta rank, do some feature engineering, and see how it looks like uh, from the NDCG perspective. Uh, from the machine learning perspective, uh, this hybrid search term, which seems like a new Invent, invention is actually just an ensemble learning approach. Uh, so you take multiple weak predictors, like, you know, BM25 per field or something, uh, combine them together, and usually this ensemble model is much stronger than each of the weak models, uh, because each weak model covers only a single part of the data set, like a specific type of feature. And even the number of stars can be considered a weak predictor, like on the reviews. Um, the typical approach of doing hybrid search is just doing some sort of linear combination of uh, BM25 and cosine distance, but there can be some issues with just doing it even on the ESCI dataset, even for two parameters, uh, because the distributions are different here. And, and uh, even the cosine distance, you assume that it's between minus one and one, but in practice, it's almost never negative. So you need to do some sort of normalization here. And the typical problems of this linear approach to hybrid search is that you need a lot of different ad hoc normalization to fit this thing so they combine together quite well because for example there are some outliers on BM25 score with value of 60 um, and even if you add more parameters here you need to do, do more manual job to to combine so they will fit together and work. Uh, there can be correlations if you, for example, decide to add some user behavior here, like click-through rate for different time frames. And then usually click-through rate for 30 and 19 days are correlated together. And there can be a problem uh, finding a proper weight for both of them because they are dependent on each other. And if there are some nonlinear dependencies, like if BM25 score is super high, then just don't use cosine similarity because it's like an exact match. Uh, nonlinear dependencies are hard to do with, you know, linear regression. But to simplify things, we're going to use Lambda Mart with Meta Rank. So it's actually NDCG focused. It can handle nonlinear dependencies. It can handle correlations because under the, hood, under the hood is just an ensemble of decision trees, which can handle it out of the box. Uh, it's actually an open source secondary ranker, but uh, usually uh, a lot of companies working in ranking and search eventually converge to developing their own internal non-documented and buggy version of MetaRank. So there is like a documented and less buggy version of the same thing you probably already have. Uh, and you can make your search focus on recall and uh, retrieval and speed and then just handle all this uh, precision related problems of top end products uh, later during the ranking. So actually MetaRank is more about about production tool, but we're going to use it in a standalone toy mode. No state, no Kafka, no feedback, just pure files. We're just feeding it with files, defining which ranking features we're going to use, and get the NDCG just to compare how good our ranking and feature setup is. Uh, we'll start with some sort of a baseline ranking uh, with a random one. Uh, because it's kind of a lower bound of our NDCG, so we cannot go below that. Uh, and it can be interesting because the ESCI dataset has a lot of exact matches. So even if you rank randomly, there would be a lot of relevant products there. So your lower bound of NDCG would be quite high. That's how you use it, do it in MetaRank, like just a random feature, Lambda Mart with XGBoost and a single feature. So, and it looks like this. It takes about one minute to process. It's not like a live demo, it's sped up video, but it takes like one minute or something. And at the end, you will get just, you know, NDCG for different, um, for different 
windows, like in DCG for top 5, top 10, top 20. And that's what we got for the, our baseline ranking on ESCI dataset. Uh, okay, let's go further and have some another more smart, more typical baseline of BM25. But the dataset has not a single field, but three fields. If we're going to use Elasticsearch for that, what are the optimal boost values for that? <laughs> Sorry. And if we even find this optimal boost values, these are still some sort of linear combinations. And if we use ESLTR for that, probably the NDCG would be higher. But uh, still uh, setting up this Elasticsearch and LTR just for our case and setup is kind of a complicated. But if you stare long enough into the formula of BM25 on Wikipedia, you might notice that you can actually compute it outside of Elasticsearch with a couple of uh, small tricks. So the formula is actually consists of two multiple parts. The first, like K1 and B are constants. That's an average document length, which is actually also kind of a constant. That's a document length. That's a number of occurrences of term in the document. So it's like a substring match. But this thing is important. So it's number, it's a term frequency, number of docs containing the item. You can't have it easily uh, separately, you need a separate pass over the data. But that's what we actually implemented in MetaRank. So the like ESLTR does, but inside of Elasticsearch, MetaRank does it outside, but with a se separate pass over the data. So you take this term frequencies and can have BM25 score between the query and title outside of Elastic. Uh, and if we plug the title in our competition table, we'll see that it's kind of going from 65 to 75, which is nice improvement, but you might wonder that we should also add a description and bullet points there to see how good it is. <coughs> That's what we're going to do, but surprisingly, our ranking uh, on the CG score is not going that far away. It's going from 75 to 76, and you might wonder why it's going on, why, why it's happening, because the SCI dataset is like a real dataset of real products made by real vendors on Amazon, and these vendors spend years optimizing titles of the products to match the most convertible queries. So that's how title of like a query allowing more tires without rims, that's the top matching products, and that's how their titles look like, that everything is there in the title. So if if you go into the description of these products or bullet points, there's not so many keywords left to put to the title. So actually, everything is there. Um, so that's kind of a very specific data set. On the case of, for example, deliver here, our vendors are selling food and selling food online is not their main business usually, so the vendor titles, product titles are not usually that SEO optimized, so it can be better in your use case. Mm, you can also plug it into the sample like categorical features. Common approach would be just one hot encoding different categories, but if you're going to use the recent versions of XGBoost or LightGBM or CatBoost, there is a native support for category, categorical encoding, so it's not like one hot encoding, because it can have some problems, because like a third level categories on Amazon, it's around 200 categories, and having a vector of dimension 200 filled with zeros is not the best way of doing it, but uh, the original idea, uh, implemented at can boost it cat boost to treat these categories as like a mathematical sets if you split your tree to, to multiple branches you don't just split by range from one to three from four to five but you split it like as a set to maximize the gain of the split and that's kind of was ported to light gbm and recently to xgboost this december or something so you can have just a numerical feature but it's not a number but an index of your category and you can also plug the numerical features there and just see how good it will be. That's kind of a why dinosaurs are there because it was approach maybe of 2017. And if it was 2017, that's what we're going to stop. Uh, so that's what we got if we go from pure BM25, but mixing some categorical information and numerical information, not that far away, like on from two to seven here, which is not that perfect. Uh, and now we're going to the area of hybrid search. Uh, the traditional understanding of hybrid search is that you have some 
uh, uh, gray birds here doing text retrieval. You have this uh, young fox doing embedding retrieval. You combine them together, but still here you feed it with the text and here you feed it with the embeddings. But where are you going to get these embeddings? There are some commercial providers like Cohere and OpenAI. Uh, we actually asked Cohere to embed ESCI data set, but they were like, why do you need it? What will happen if there would be some problems so that our embeddings are worse, so on. Uh, you can take sentence transformers. There are plenty of pre-trained models there. And you can also do your own. We'll try to do two parts at the bottom uh, and start with the sentence transformers. The idea of this building embeddings and sentence transformers is that you have a BERT model, which is old and uh, reliable. You embed your document and the query in parallel, like here is for the document, here is for the query, and similar document and queries are close in this cosine distance space. Uh, there are a couple practical implications there that um, it means that all the document indexing and computing this embeddings for documents can be done offline and only once. And you only need to embed the query during the query time, which is nice because query is just a single query and documents, you have a lot of documents. And you don't even need to, to intersect your query with all the documents. There's plenty of algorithms to do approximate nearest neighbor search just to match top end products. Mm. There is a most famous model of the sentence transformer, so everyone is speaking about that, this mini LM L6, which is not the smartest one on, on search, which is not this, the fastest one, but still it's kind of a good balance between the speed of inference on CPU and the being precise during semantic search. Uh, uh, to use it in Python, that's kind of how the whole code needs to be written to use it in Python, like sentence transformers and code and combine the compute the similarity, that's it. But there can be some practical problems with this approach. What if you are not using Python? For example, like Delivery Hero, most of the um, search part, like the query processing part is written in Java and Kotlin, and it's hard to plug Python there. You can have some sort of external microservice written in Python to do the inference for you, but it looks kind of uh, not nice. Is there a way to do it in uh, like without leveraging Python. Yes, uh, that's, there is a way to translate your Torch model to NNX and run it. In, in our case, it's in Java, but there is also runtime for Go and other languages. And But for Java, it looks not as nice as in Python because you need to do a lot of manual work, which is hidden uh, by the sentence transformers library. You translate it, you take this BERT full tokenizer for a deep Java library, produce this. So this ONNX models and PyTorch models, they eat tensors like matrices and produce matrices. It's your job to map the text to this matrix, to the input matrix. That's what we're going to do here, is just tokenizing it, converting it into some like array of floats, and then creating the specific tensors which can be fed into ONNX and just running it. It's not the first time this code is being written. So originally, it w I saw this approach in the internals of Vespa or their ONNX support for ranking. Then it appeared in open search model serving and at last in MetaRank, but actually it's not that hard to be, uh, to be done. Uh, in practice, in uh, MetaRank, that's all you need to run B encoders. They're just a special type of matching to different fields with everything is hidden here. You can load any ONNX encoded model from Hugging Face. And if you plug your non-fine-tuned generic model here, you will get kind of a not also perfect result in this case, probably because this BM25 matching is already quite optimized on Amazon. And you kind of better, but not significantly better. Mm. But uh, in sentence transformers, there are sm uh, larger and smarter models which having a better scores on semantic search, like this L12 with 12 layers and a bit more parameters, and Impanet, which is like 10 times, 10 times bigger and having a longer embeddings, might be these models might help us. And looks like the answer is yes, but still insignificantly. So you go from 76.7 to 76.9, increasing the model size 10 times. Probably if you increase it 10 times or maybe 100 times, it will go further, but still it might be not worth it without just doing anything specific on your data set. You can always convert any 
PyTorch model from Hugging Face to NNX with a single like transformer, so NNX conversion tool. You can also do it manually with some Python code. You can go for the Hugging Face repo for MetaRank to see how it's done. Um, but the cosine similarity of hybrid search is just yet another ranking feature. It's yet another weak predictor, so we can plug it into our ensemble model. And if we plug it as is, uh, just with BM25 and this non-fine-tuned mini-LM, we got a nice bump from 76 to 78. And mixing metadata, it goes a bit further. But still, you see that it looks like that BM25 as a term matching and... Uh, semantic matching are covering different aspects of the data sets and combined together they're showing you the strength of this ensemble model but we can go further and do a bit of fine tuning usually fine tuning consider it as a like a black magic and no one knows how it should be done because it sound it, it refers to a lot of different terms no one understands how it should be done but technically it's not that hard i will just try to fine tune this mini lm model and you will see that it's actually easy so the process of fine tuning is that you take already uh, existing large language model from hugging face from sentence transformers and then you uh, put an put it in a very specific situation so it's like there are two copies of this model and there is a specific type of loss like cosine similarity loss from sentence transformers you feed it with two different sentences and trying to uh, do a back propagation pass uh, through the spytorch training to optimize the BERT model to minimize the cosine similarity between sentences. You do it across the whole data set and at the end it seems to be working better. Um, which one to pick? You can take actually anything from the, from the hugging face, but uh, there can be some problems there because these models, like Microsoft Mini LM, original one, not from the sentence transformers, uh, has no clue about sentence similarity. Uh, so you need to train it. They, they trained for the predicting next term and not about the similarity between terms. Uh, and you need a large data set to train it for the sentence similarity. It's quite slow. You can take something from the sentence transformer which already know about sentence similarity. Uh, you don't need a lot of queries to do any fine tuning from our, my experience is like just starting with top 1000 queries is still okay and better than nothing. The problem of sentence transformers, it seems that it's a bit abandoned and there would be no new models added. So mini LM is quite old one. Mm, for the losses, there are multiple types of loss, like a sense similarity loss. You need triplets, like a query, document, and a score for fine-tuning. Uh, for the case of ESCI, there are two approaches of how to map these labels of exact match, uh, substitute, complementary, and irrelevant products to these numbers. You can do linear, you can do exponential. We'll see which one works better. But from the docs, they mentioned that they don't need to be hard negatives here. So so it can be any scale, uh, but it's kind of a slow to converge in practice. Uh, but actually, the sentence transformers models, most of them were trained with another, another type of loss called multiple negatives ranking loss, uh, which requires triplets of query, positive example, and negative example. So that's also a question how to map our labels to exact and like positive and negative examples. But authors mentioned that having uh, it's essential to have a good negative examples. You can't just uh, randomly sample your data set and say that that's a negative example. There should be really hard negative examples. So you need to 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 force your model to do some uh, job to distinguish between uh, irrelevant products. So like uh, distinguishing dogs from trains is easy, but this is a bit more complicated. That's how your negative examples should look like. <clears throat> in practice, in e-commerce, there are not so many explicit uh, relevancy labels exist. That's usually about uh, implicit feedback. So you have some clicks, conversions about search results for particular queries. But you still can do some sort of a tricks how, to, how it can be converted into the relevancy labels. So you can base it on a confidence. So if you have for a specific query high per query click-through rate or conversion rate, conversion rate, then it can be assumed as a positive 
positive example if it's a low uh, click-through rate with high confidence is that a negative example if it's a low confidence you have no idea what's that you can just drop these results and don't treat them as negatives or positives and you can balance the size of your data set by just moving these borders of what is considered relevant and irrelevant mm. And that's actually the whole code you need to write for the fine tuning, uh, literally. The only thing that I'm um, excluded is just parsing JSON from the ASCI. That's it, you just define your cosine similarity loss, call model fit. You can take anything from sentence transformers or hugging face, all the other transformer models are also supported, and then just wait. It seems to be quite a straightforward thing, uh, but you should watch for a couple of factors while training. So for the batch size, it should be the largest you can ever afford. Uh, we also saw that on a small data sets, it's quite easy to overfit if you go more than one or two epochs. And the actual fine tuning on a practical data sets of a size of ESCI or deliver here is still fast enough to be done even for free on Google Collab. It just takes a couple of minutes. Uh, but in practice, uh, if you try to do it on CPU, uh, so uh, you might be quite surprised. So that's my GPU I bought on eBay for 200 bucks, and it's six minutes for the training, and that's a 16-core CPU, and that's 40 times slower. On M1, it's actually not that bad, but it's still not going to be 40 times slower, but maybe only 10 times slower. Uh, so it's better to use GPUs for training, especially if you're going to run a lot of different experiments. So okay, let's see how it goes with the different ways of fine-tuning this mini-LM model on ESCI dataset. So we start with multiple negatives loss with exact and irrelevant products only as advised in docs. And we got a nice improvement compared to the non-fine-tuned models. We add also a supplement com a complementary and substitute uh, items here and we got a better NDCG here, probably because our data set become much bigger because there are not so many irrelevant products in the data sets and now we make it a bit more balanced. Uh, for the cosine uh, similarity loss and linear mapping, it's also around 78, but if we do the exponential mapping, as seen in the original paper of the ESCI data set, you go to 78.8, which is the best result we got for this mini-LM model. But wait, you might under wonder that there are bigger models on sentence transformers. What will happen if we take another one? Uh, so that's our best result for the, the small model. If we take the 12 layer one, it would not go that far away. But if we take the larger model, it goes significantly way above 79. Uh, my understanding is that the larger the language model, the better it is able to generalize and the less uh, data it needs to be fine to, to be fine tuned. Uh, Perfect example, an absolute example would be like a chat GPT, which is gigantic. You need just a couple of prompts to explain what needs to be done, and then it works. Uh, we can also plug this fine-tuned models into our learn to rank ensemble, and we are going from 78 on non-fine-tuned one to 80 on a fine-tuned one, but we're not going to stop here. Ah, that, that's actually a price to pay because the larger you mod, the, the larger the model, the slower is the latency. In original Beir paper, uh, which is usually quoted at least five times during haystacks, uh, there is a reference that it's kind of a running it on CPU can be slow. We tried to compare how slow it is, and for this model on in an X right time, you see it can go from 13 milliseconds per single query embedding to 64 for this larger model. So it's not as bad, it's still practical, but going from 100 million parameters to 1 billion parameters probably will go somewhere, you know, around half a second or something on CPU. And that's kind of a normal. So the main conclusion for this part of the B encoder talk is that uh, the larger the LLM, the better. The, tra the smaller the training set you need. Fine tuning is actually not that complicated. You can just 
try it on your laptop for just simple huge relevancy boost for just nothing. And ESCI dataset is not complete e-commerce. In practice, uh, in Deliver Hero, there's not so many SEO optimization spent by vendor, made by vendors. So the improvement of fine tuning is much more dramatic uh, compared to this ESCI dataset. And don't run it on CPU. That's kind of the main thing. Uh, then the last part of my talk is cross encoders. Cross encoders are like B encoders, but smarter. So. In instead of this doing some sort of pooling and cosine similarity, we just slap a yet another neural network on top of BERT to make your to, to do to do the classification task. So it's not doing cosine similarity, it's just doing neural network magic instead of cosine similarity, and you just feed your query and document together into the network and it will just say you is it relevant or not. Uh, there are plenty of different pre-trained cross encoders. They're pre-trained on the MS Marco data set on Thenton transformers. And it's easy to use them. You just, you know, take the cross encoders and put two pairs of sentences, like how many people live in Berlin. And Berlin is well known for its museums. That's probably not a good match, but still the keywords are here. Uh, the uh, the absolute example of uh, uh, cross encoders would be like a chat GPT with a prompt of how relevant is this text for this query on a scale of zero to one, but in a more automated way and without using chat GPT. But the problems of this cross encoders is that uh, there is no way to do approximate key and search. You can only run it over a specific set of documents. You can run it over the whole data set you, if you have enough money just to feed it in a single context or just on a top end matching product sorted by BM25 or cosine similarity. Uh, you can also plug it into MetaRank, just, just cross encoder thing. And if we go and take non-fine tuned MS Marco cross encoder for the, from the sentence transformers, we'll see that our indice G score compared to just, um, you know, mini LM goes up quite significantly. This is like a zero shot type of ranking. It never seen anything from e-commerce. It's just, you know, an MS Marco model, uh, but it's still already quite significantly better. Uh, can we go further and fine tune it on uh, this particular data set? And fine tuning cross encoders is also quite, that's the whole code. Apart from the data loader, that's it. Uh, so and even there is no loss because you know there is only a single type of loss supported for cross encoders and sentence transformers. So you just put your data set an epoch size learning rate and just the place to save your model and that's kind of it. Um, and if you fine tune our mini LM L6 model, but, but on the ESCI dataset, we go to 0 0.80, which is already quite a good result. But there is also L12 model, which is a bit deeper and a bit uh, bigger. And if you fine tune, we go to 81, which is quite a good improvement compared to just uh, B encoders or maybe BM25 type of search. Uh, but technically, we can combine everything in an ultimate ensemble because why not? We're just doing learn to rank here, just both the square title over this impinet fine tuned, the cross encoders, BM25, all the thing we know about the data just in a single uh, model, and we got like 82 at the end. That's the best result we could get. Uh, in the beer paper, that's an interesting observation here. That's the cross encoders. There is the smartest one on the beer paper, but you can see that's their latency. So even on, they are even slow on GPU. On CPU, they are like horribly slow. And we wanted to uh, see how horrible, so what is the definition of horrible for this particular case? So we did some sort of a benchmark of this MS Marker model for cross encoders. And it seems to be not as horrible as we thought. So if we just feed it one pair of sentences, it will be just 12 milliseconds. For 10, it's about 58. And going to 100, it becomes quite, quite a lot. Uh, so you can do a couple of tricks to make your B encoders and cross encoders 
uh, working better, so you can just pre-compute everything, not everything, but at least 90 or 80 percent of top queries. It's a bit more complicated with cross encoders because you need to, you can't just pre-compute query embeddings, you need to pre-compute pairs. You can take top 10 queries, top 100 results sorted by BM25, and then pre-compute them and put them into the cache. So then you at least can make this model more affordable or maybe rank a bit more results than if you then without caching uh, are they practical so that's kind of a good question if uh, with cross encoders you might need to go from like two level of a ranking to maybe three level of a ranking so the first one is focused on retrieval and recall the second one is focused mostly on the uh, precision but without using anything super complicated or latency specific latency heavy and maybe you just do the final tuning of top 10 results with cross encoders otherwise you will be out of your latency budget or you need to do GPU inference and GPU inference for search can be quite pricey so that's the T4 instance which is like the cheapest GPU instance you can get on Amazon that's like four or five year old it can be better than CPU at least like on price uh, on the price to performance radio and uh, some, something more moderate like v V100 will cost you quite a lot and you probably need more than one this instance. So be warned. So um, if you like the journey over the e-commerce uh, search we made in the stock, actually there is a new track in track uh, competition focused on e-commerce search. Uh, so it's based on ESCI data set. The queries and data is not yet released. It would be released in in next week, but the gen there are three subtracks where we did something like this, we just to rank top something matching documents, but there are other tracks on the end-to-end -end retrieval, so just search over the complete 1.7 million products or do a multimodal search because there can be also images and clicks and it can be a great summer if you want to compete here. Uh, there are no prizes, only just a matter of intellectual superiority. So, um, but still you're welcome. I plan to also take part. Uh, there is also a page on GitHub with the recent uh, updates, but not so many of them, but still you can put your email to be notified whenever something would be released. Um, so the actual um, playground we used for this uh, talk, well, with all the pre-trained and non-fine-tuned models are available on GitHub on the MetaRank repo. Uh, it might be quite slow to run, especially for the cross encoders case. So we usually just uh, pre-computed everything. And the final words is that your search platform can be seen as a, like, it's not uh, fixed, it's like on a spectrum of being smart, cheap, and fast. And you need to pick two, uh, sometimes even one. Uh, so it's some sort of a balance between hardware costs and ranking quality. And uh, the, f the second conclusion is that fine tuning is not rocket science. You can figure out how things work maybe, I don't know, in two days or three days. So it would be great to make it like a commodity. And there is no silver bullet. Probably you need to combine multiple ways of ranking and retrieving into a symbol, single ensemble uh, with the maximum, the best result ever. So that's it. If you have questions, probably we have time. Okay, so uh, we have a lot of questions online, so I'm going to try and get as many questions through as possible. You're a popular man, man. Um, right. <coughs> Our first person here, Mr. Max Irwin. Great talk, Roman. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, just a quick question: the NDCG scores you posted, was that were those that on a holdout data set, or was that the full product query set? Yes, CI has a breakdown over what is training, what is a holdout, so I just used it as a split. So it trained on the training data set, the evaluation is made on the evaluation data set, so it's a holdout one. Okay, so we've got a question from our online audience. Uh, 
Dave Debar asks, is domain adaptation, continued language modeling for your domain before fine tuning, useful for vector search? Uh, the reason of doing this talk is was to have some uh, numbers. So before that, it was just opinions. You probably need to fine tune, but you need to, to see it with your own data. I tried to do it for the ESCI data set and some internal data sets, and the conclusions are kind of the same. So you probably need to try. I never tried to do some domain specific annotation. But as for my experience, this large language models are kind of doing a lot of traditional uh, things from the tra uh, from term search just for free. Like you got some uh, categorical information. You know that uh, pepperoni is a type of pizza. You don't need to create synonyms for that. So it's you need to compare. It depends on how much work you expect to do. Uh, in the case of um, Delivery Hero, uh, they're working, we were working on a different markets and you need to support not only English, but like 10 languages. And it's always a challenge to do this domain annotation for a language you are not a professional speaker. Like, okay, can you do it, but in a simplified Chinese? Wonderful. And now do the same thing, but in traditional Chinese. And that's always a challenge. So for this domain annotation, it depends. You need to try and it depends on your use case. Okay, thank you. So next question is here, and I'll come over there, the next one. Thank you. It was a great talk. Uh, maybe I missed it, but you're, you glossed over out of vocabulary, or was it in there somewhere? Uh, vocabulary for... In other words, how to, how to handle it's out of vocabulary, right? So one of the weaknesses of the language models uh, is maybe it's not in the vocabulary of that model. Uh, that's a good question uh, because it's doing some sort. So it's not like a traditional stemming you do inside of a term search. If something is not in your vocabulary, you cannot stem it. It can be problems if there are multiple word forms. But language models use a word piece type of tokenization. So it's not splitting your word into just a root of the word and an ending. It might do some weird splits which are optimized by the coverage of your vocabulary. So even if the word is not a in, in a vocabulary, it will still be split maybe on a subword parts, but the neural network on the next step when it will see your term in the uh, training data set, and in the case of transformers, it's like half of the internet, it will figure it out that, okay, that's not in the vocabulary, but it's still in my uh, mental model of the neural network what it is. So if it's not on a vocabulary, it doesn't mean that it doesn't know about that. And still, there are different ways, different models uh, for different types of vocabularies. So BERT is like 32,000 uh, uh, subwords in the vocabulary, but there are some new models which go up to 300,000 terms in vocabulary. So it depends on the model. OK. So we have another question from our online audience, from Patrick, who says, how do you match top N between BM25 and embedding models? Suppose you go to get 10 results from your BM25, but you get 1,000 from your vector model. We just like zip intersect them. So there can be a, a document uh, matched by BM25. There can be the same document matched by your vector search engine. And then that's just two numbers, two ranking features, the BM25 score and the cosine similarity score of this document. If this document is not matched by BM25, it means that the BM25 score is just zero or just missing, depends on how you define it in the ranking. So just zero out unknown parts, and that's it. Thank you. Doug. Um, I, I did not, I'm not going to say more of a question than a comment, like Max wants me to. But uh, I did have just a question, which is, uh, have you tried using image data, like from Renee's talk last night? Uh, that's no, d d didn't have time, but there would be a tr sub track in track for this multimodal and there would be images. So there would be someone doing it definitely and probably from the next week. Okay. We've got another online question. Sorry, we have a lot to get through to this here. So Senthil Kumar um, asks, um, how do you determine the thresholds to add embeddings based retrieval? documents. Does that make sense? 
Uh, yeah, it makes sense, but uh, you can have some... S so that's a question. I don't know the specific answer. So <laughs> take 10. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right, let's have, have another question from the room. Yeah. Connor. Thank you. Uh, Awesome. Uh, could I miss the detail about how you did, sorry, talking in the microphone, <laughs> uh, about how you use the caching when you're training the cross encoder? So you cannot cache, there is no embeddings. So you cannot cache the embedding, but you can cache the score, like the matching score between the query and the document. You can pre compute this cache by just uh, taking top 1,000 queries and top uh, 100 documents matching to this query by, for example, BM25 score or doing some vector search. And then you just pre-compute. You can do it offline on GPUs and it would be quite cheap to do. And then if the query is unique and you never seen it, for in practice, there maybe for this food search, it's around 10% of queries which are constantly unique across different languages, so you can't pre-compute them because they're happening once in a lifetime. I don't know what people are typing there. Uh, but then you just uh, fall back to the traditional cross-encoders, but at least in this approach, you cover 90% of query document pairs in the traffic uh, without doing real-time inference with cross-encoders. So in practice, you can go from 10 to maybe 70, 80 within the same latency budget. Yeah, there can be problems if uh, for this particular complicated queries, but still you can have some estimation on how many new products you can add there and uh, estimation of the overall, overall latency before doing the inference. Okay, I'm really sorry. We're gonna to have to stop it there for the questions and our online audience. Uh, if you'd like to paste your question into the Haystack Conference channel in relevant Slack, uh, Roman is there, so I'm yeah. sure you're going to be able to answer them uh, after the fact. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you.